It is a mysterious illness that's affected US diplomats worldwide, attacking the nervous system, and in some cases, forcing people into early retirement. It's called the Havana syndrome, but what or who is behind it? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Peter Dobby. More than five years on and the so-called Havana syndrome is back with us. Four American diplomats have fallen sick this week with suspected cases of the syndrome in Paris and Geneva. The US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, says the federal government is working to identify the illness and who or what might be behind it. The mystery condition has affected about 200 diplomats and their family members since 2016. It's believed the ailment may be caused by what's called a directed energy attack. Symptoms include migraines, nausea, memory loss and dizziness. And it can be so bad it's forced some victims into early retirement. We'll begin our discussion in a moment. First, let's take a closer look at how it all started. So, it's called Havana Syndrome because the first cases were reported in 2016 by US diplomats in Cuba. They started experiencing neurological symptoms, mimicking what happens after a concussion, but they had suffered no head injuries. Since then, dozens more cases have been reported by US officials and their families based around the world, including in Russia and in China. A number of Canadian diplomatic staff in Cuba were also affected. A CIA team searching for a cause has focused on about 200 cases which do remain unexplained. In September, the US President Joe Biden signed into law a bill to compensate the victims. OK, there we are. Here we go. Let's bring in our guests. In Auckland, in New Zealand, we have Robert Bartholomew, honorary senior lecturer in the Department of Psychological Medicine at the University of Auckland. He's also the co-author of Havana Syndrome, Mass Psychogenic Illness and the Real Story Behind the Embassy Mystery and Hysteria. In Colchester, in Essex in the UK, we have Natasha Lindstadt, author and specialist on US foreign policy. She's Social Sciences Deputy Dean at the University of Essex. And in Boston, in Massachusetts, in the US, we have Glenn Carl, a career CIA officer and formerly a Deputy National Intelligence Officer. Welcome to you all. Glenn Carl in Boston. Havana Syndrome, what might it be? Well, the immediate thought, I think, of all of my colleagues and uh, it the institutions uh, involved in foreign policy is uh, that the uh, the Russians are the most likely ones to have done uh, this kind of uh, activity, whether to obtain intelligence or to harass or both. We don't know, and we don't know that it's the Russians, but that's the, the reflexive thought. There are probably only four countries or so uh, that would have um, the capability or the interest in doing this sort of thing, assuming uh, if that what uh, appears to be happening is, is happening. And that would be Russia, China, Iran, North Korea. Uh, but uh, nobody knows. This is one of the big mysteries. Natasha Lindstadt in Colchester. Has there been anything like this in the past? Not that I know of. Nothing like this where we have no idea what is really causing this. I mean, there was some speculation that there were some sort of microwave attacks that had occurred to uh, against uh, Americans in in Russia uh, in the Soviet Union uh, but there's nothing like this where we don't really even know what the diagnosis is who is doing it what it actually is there's a lot more questions than answers and that's what makes it so puzzling and we don't even know if it is something real um, so we're, we're still looking for, for answers, but I, I have the view that this is something that is real because we've seen that some of the victims have still been dealing with some of the, the after effects, that they're still experiencing nausea, nausea and, and headaches. Uh, and, and there's enough people describing similar symptoms that this is something to take really seriously. Robert Bartholomew in Auckland, uh, in New Zealand. I've counted so far here on the programme seven uses of the word it. We don't know what it is, Robert. Is the time now here to call it a covert sonic weapon? I think the evidence is overwhelming that it is mass psychogenic illness. 
And the problem with this whole episode is you've got politics being mixed with science. And all you need to know is, recently, in September of last year, the head of the Biden administration panel looking into this, Pamela Spratlin, would not rule out the possibility of mass psychogenic illness, and she was forced to resign. And people were saying, we're not crazy. We're not suffering from a mental disorder. Mass psychogenic illness does not mean you're crazy or you're suffering from a mental disorder. They are real symptoms. This is a real condition that has been known for thousands of years. And the evidence is overwhelming that what we're looking at here is mass psychogenic illness. But and Robert, politics, just, just to pause you there for a second, mixed. Robert, what you're saying when you talk about a, a mass psychogenic illness, psychogenic illness, AKA people think themselves into being really sick with the same symptoms because they're in the same data stream, data group when it comes to be analyzed. But what we're talking about here is career diplomats. We're talking about people who are intelligent, well-traveled. They're, they're, they're well-educated people. They're presumably mature and they're in their 40s, their 50s. They don't tear up when they're watching Hallmark TV. You know, they don't tear up when they're watching a chick flick, a girly movie, when they're watching something that put tugs at the, the, the heartstrings. No one is immune to mass psychogenic illness because mass psychogenic illness is based on a belief. Think of it as the placebo effect in reverse. If I give you a sugar pill and tell you you're going to feel better, often you will. It's the power of framing. But if I give you a sugar pill and tell you you're going to feel better, and someone rushes in and says, oh my God, that sugar pill I just gave you, it's been contaminated with rat poison, there's a good chance that within a few minutes you'll get headache, stomach pain, nausea, you might even vomit, but there's nothing physically wrong with you. Think of it as a software problem, an overstimulation of the nervous system. But the reality, Glenn Carl in Boston, surely is this. Russia, the United States and China, you mentioned one or two others, they have all researched microwaves as weapons. And I don't mean they went to a supermarket, they bought a microwave and they threw it at somebody. I mean, they, they tried to come up with technology that used a microwave gun or a device or something that could point microwaves at an individual or at a building? Yes, that's true. But first, I, I think uh, I have to correct the, the first error that I have ever heard Al Jazeera make, which is that CIA officers don't cry at Hallmark movies. <laughs> and I can contradict that, uh, in, in fact. Um, it, it does occur on occasion. Um, but the, the to be more serious, the uh, Deputy Chief of Mission, American uh, diplomat who was removed from, I think, believe her position uh, for having raised the possibility of psychogenic uh, illness. Uh, that, that occurred, yes, and I think that was an error to do. I think uh, what may not be um, accepted or understood uh, by the broad public and, and perhaps by uh, my colleague uh, in, in Auckland is that it is one of the possibilities that I am certain uh, is being uh, analyzed. Uh, it, the people who reacted are the victims, and one would understand that if they feel sick, they would uh, take uh, umbrage at having been characterized as uh, as loony, um, which is how they would they would react to it. Although that's not the case of the uh, in the diagnosis. But I but I'm certain that the State Department, the CIA, the military, the government as a whole is looking at all the possibilities. The first step that one takes when we don't, when one doesn't know what's going on in, in science is you categorize, uh, because what more can one do? And I think we're, we are still stuck in that position of simply trying to gather uh, facts to the extent we can establish that they are facts. Uh, no one uh, knows, and I don't think any possibility should be, or, or actually is being uh, uh, dismissed, uh, but the, uh, I would very seriously doubt uh, that 200 colleagues in disparate countries at different times uh, would uh, suffer from uh, uh, a collective delusion. And my, my last comment for the moment is the working title of my book, which is about torture um, in the CIA and the U.S. government, was Victims of Delusion. And, and I have seen uh, people sincerely believe uh, uh, events, actions, uh, to be uh, one uh, thing and uh, to personally to have observed and to know that that is not the case. And yet 
my colleagues are intelligent and sincere. So I, I'm not dismissive of the, the potential of delusion. I really don't believe that that's likely in this instance. And also, Glenn Carl, just to flesh out what you've just said briefly, in, in, in about 30 seconds, statistically, we're talking about 200 people who have operated at the, in the upper echelons of the International Diplomatic Service. It is highly unlikely, surely, that they have character traits that link them and they are given to behaving in a way where they clearly lack emotional equilibrium and they believe that they have a certain set of symptoms, so therefore they carry on displaying those symptoms even when they are ending up working part-time or they have been retired from that job early. Well, I think that's true. Um, I, I think perhaps more significant is that the, the reports of uh, the, the syndrome uh, came uh, really out of the blue from people who are uh, not sub inclined to conspiracy uh, theory uh, thinking or to um, jumping to conclusions. And they said, this is what I feel. And uh, from there, uh, there has been an investigation. And then, as I understand it, independent of any reports of, quote, Havana syndrome having occurred, that people reported this uh, phenomenon uh, separately and without knowledge of it having occurred okay. uh, elsewhere. So someone in Paris uh, felt these symptoms and said, hey, I, I, my brain is not working right. And someone in Havana said, I'm suffering from X or Y. And they were independent of uh, each other, not, not a uh, copycat, uh, uh, subliminally influenced event, so far Understood. as I understand it. Natasha in Colchester, do we need to subdivide the conversation that we're having here about the technology? One remembers a package, a report that we carried on this channel, I think it was 2016, 2017, uh, about the Havana syndrome using microwaves slash sound delivered by some sort of sound cannon device. And the people we spoke to, I, I remember this clearly at the time, they said it would have to be so big that you couldn't do it in secret because you've got to have literally speakers the size of a concert venue, speakers on the back of a truck. And if you drive that up to a secure compounded type zone surrounding an embassy, everyone would see you. And yet, on the other hand, the sound cannon technology is there, it is out there, and the London authorities, this, this is a matter of fact, the London authorities had plans or a conversation to use it around about the Olympics in 2012 for crowd control purposes. So some of the technology is out there, we know about it, some of the technology is patently fanciful, no? Well, I think that's one of the big issues we don't completely understand what technology is being used. And we can't rule out that it could be possible. It's a technology that, that we haven't discovered yet of whatever group is using this or entity or state is using this, uh, that there are so many unknowns about it. But one thing we do know, the victims have reported hearing a sound, a loud sound in their head um, before they started having problems. So there may be something connected to that that needs to be better I explored, um, that, that it's not just something in their head that that was actually a common stream amongst the victims. Um, and, and just to bring back the uh, issue of Russia, this is why I think at least my gut reaction upon hearing about this was that this could involve the Russians. I mean, there's no evidence that it does, um, but this is sort of one of their hallmarks is secretly using, whether it be nerve agents or you know, biological chemical weapons, to really perforate. And that's how they use sharp power, to perforate the enemy, to undermine them, not using sort of conventional weapons, but to create havoc and disarray, so discontent. And, and look at what the end outcome is. If we just look at the Cuban case, you know, the Cuban embassy used to have, the U.S. and the Cuban embassy uh, in, in Havana used to have 54 diplomats there. Now it's down to 10. And there was a real opening there to improve relations between the U.S. and Cuba, and this has dissipated. So the, the real outcome uh, is the thing that we also need to investigate. Who is really benefiting from this, in addition to also exploring what is the technology? OK. Robert Bartholomew, we'll come back to that point in a second, Natasha, if you may. Robert Bartholomew in Auckland. Clearly, you are a sceptic. But arguably, the father of Havana syndrome was a thing called the Moscow Signal. You cannot explain from your stance why back-to-back -back consecutive U.S. ambassadors 
in the 60s into the 70s in Moscow, died of cancer. The man who got the job in 1976 was diagnosed very quickly with a severe blood disorder, and then he later died of leukemia. That's three US ambassadors who worked in the same building, in the same city, in the same country, all died of a form of cancer. Well, people die of cancer, but here's, here's my point that I want to make, and that is the U.S. Robert, can government I pause you? Can you just Can you just address my question, please, sir? Back to back, three U.S. ambassadors to Moscow die of a form of cancer. Statistically, that is highly, highly unlikely. I don't know what that has to do with Havana syndrome, though, and the way the U.S. government has treated this. For example, the FBI report has been leaked, and the FBI concluded that it was mass psychogenic illness, straight up, not microwaves. In 2018, there was a secret Jason report of elite scientists who examined the possibility of microwaves, and they said it was virtually impossible. Because if you go back and look at the context of what's going on here, the first 21 people who reported their symptoms, eight of them recorded the attacks when they happened. Those recordings were analyzed by that government classified group, and they concluded that they were the mating sounds of the Indies short-tailed cricket. So the U.S. government kept those reports secret until recently. The FBI report still hasn't been released. The FOIA documents on the Jason report didn't come out until September of this past year. So the U.S. government needs to be more open and frank about what they're doing. And the other point that's important is, I've been told that of the 200 people globally that have been affected, about 100 of them were intelligence officers. And people say, well, how can you explain that? I can explain that from a psychological standpoint, because the first people who reported symptoms in Cuba were intelligence officers. And then the U.S. government, the State Department and the Department of Defense has issued alerts around the world for people to be on the lookout for anomalous health incidents and that intelligence officers may be the targets. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay. Uh, Natasha, do we have to accept that there is clearly a political glaze on top of this debate? And it's this. Presidents and prime ministers from or in the affected countries need to adjudicate on what is possibly a killer condition that doesn't kill for months or years. It slowly disables and then it kills people. But the reality is that presidents and prime ministers don't want to adjudicate because then they have to accept the idea of culpability. That's why certain diplomats are actually suing their employer, i.e. the government of the country where they come from. Right, that's what is what makes it so, so complicated because if we uh, admit that there is really something there, uh, then that puts a lot of liability on the governments to take care of their employees to ensure that particular diplomats are representatives of the state are, are safe or intelligence officers are, are safe. Uh, and, and so it puts governments in a very precarious situation. Now, you already mentioned the new bill to try to offer better support for people who have been victim of some sort of traumatic brain injury. I mean, they're really careful about the wording that they're using here. They don't also want to pinpoint blame on the wrong country. So you see that representatives of the U.S. government, for example, have been very, very cautious and careful with the way they, they talk about this. Uh, but I think that they're trying to explore all options because, I mean, one scenario, if it's nothing, if it's something that is more psychosomatic, uh, that's one thing. But I, I really believe it's more likely that it is another country involved. Um, and, and then that requires further investigation and pressure to understand who is culpable and responsible for this. Glenn Carl in Boston, clearly the people directly affected by this, whether it's real, imagined, whether they've thought themselves into it or whether it is actually somebody, someplace pulling the strings, it doesn't really matter. Do they need to have formal recognition that they have got something? Oh, I think, well, and President Biden and the administration, the State Department, the uh, national security establishment have uh, moved to to recognize this and to, to take this seriously. And so th that's a simple answer. Uh, yes, they that should occur, and, and is, it is occurring. If I could go back to a point you made before, 
Um, of course, we all know that um, correlation is not necessarily causation. However, uh, we do know uh, multiple instances in multiple different ways that the Russians specifically have done all sorts of things uh, that uh, to specific, most, mostly intelligence, American intelligence officers, uh, that have caused harm. They have used radioactive powders that are invisible. They have used uh, different kinds of waves. Uh, I don't uh, know the, the details of the three ambassadors, but, but I do know that the Russians have used radioactive materials uh, against uh, some of them, colleagues of mine I know and have worked with personally and closely, uh, to uh, harass, uh, at the least, to harass. So it's not a, uh, a stretch to think that uh, the likely uh, perpetrator uh, are, are the Russians. Now, the second point I'd like to make, and I'll, I'll be brief, is I think our, our colleague in, in Auckland perhaps is misconstruing uh, the process that the uh, the government would, would go through uh, by focusing on the dead ends uh, that uh, one will uh, encounter in an investigation. And I don't think that things have been suppressed really uh, at all. One wouldn't want a report that has been found to be uh, not conclusive or uh, leading the investigation astray or, or, or so on uh, to be uh, taken as uh, to frame the perception of the overall uh, uh, investigation okay. when the conclusion so far is that we don't have one. Glenn, I'm, I'm going to interrupt to you then because we are rapidly approaching the end of the program. Let's go back to Robert Bartholomew in Auckland. Robert, some of the people directly affected by this have not been near Cuba, the island, the country, Havana, the capital city, or the U.S. Embassy. They, they didn't sleep near a colony of crickets on the other side of an open window. Some of the Canadians that have been directly affected by something have been transported from Ottawa to Halifax, Nova Scotia. They have been medically tested, and it's been found that the left-hand side of their brain does not connect properly with the right-hand side of their brain. That's a matter of medical fact. On top of that, some of the Canadians... No, you're shaking your head. Hang on, let me finish. Some of the Canadians are displaying the early symptoms of Parkinson's, Alzheimer's or general dementia. Again, I've used the word to you three times in this discussion. Statistically, that is highly unlikely. And they had no conversation with the Americans who were affected by this. Well, that's just not true. The Canadians and the Americans knew what was going on because the Americans were sharing data no, the with The individual them. people didn't and, talk um, to each other. There wasn't some sort of hysteria transferred down a Skype line from an American diplomat to a Canadian diplomat. That's exactly what was going on. It spread like wildfire. The diplomats in the American embassy that we talked to said that everybody knew it spread like wildfire throughout the embassies. And then they were told, don't sleep near or stand near windows and things like this, which really hyped up the anxiety. And I also want to address the point about why not release the FBI document, because it might misconstrue things. Well, why was the CDC document released? Why was the National Academy of Sciences document released when those documents were also inconclusive? Natasha, very last word to you. In the next 30 seconds of the programme, if this is a weapon, it is an amazing weapon, and I use the word amazing um, advisedly. The next iteration of this weapon, what might it be capable of doing? I think that's the scary thing, is the unknown, and it might be capable of being unleashed on a larger... Uh population. Uh, and that would really disable uh, a, a big portion of, of the public if they're able to 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 leash it uh, on a, a much greater uh, part of the population. And I think that's one of the unknowns that makes this so incredibly scary, because we have people retiring from their jobs that they were really passionate about because they've been so disabled by this mysterious syndrome. OK, we must leave it there. Thank you to our guests. They were Robert Bartholomew, Natasha Lindstadt and Glenn Carl. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the show again anytime via our website, aljazeera.com. And for more discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Peter Dobby and everyone on the team here in Doha, thanks for watching. I will see you very soon, usual time, tomorrow. Bye-bye.